Hi, welcome to the first of our two-part series of Facebook Live events in honor of National Breast Cancer Awareness Month. We're excited to have you here with us today, and I've got three guests here that we'll be talking to. Um, from Enlo's Comprehensive Breast Care, Dr. Lydia Schrader is here with us. She's the medical director and a breast surgeon. And Dara McKinley, who is a, a registered nurse with the Comprehensive Breast Care, and we'll be talking about some genetic testing. Nurse and practitioner. Nurse practitioner. Mm -hmm. Ah, I already got it wrong, <laughs> but welcome. <laughs> and then Patty Mol Molinero from the uh, California Health Collaborative and Every Woman Counts program is here. Patty's a registered nurse with the program. So thank you all for being here today. It's really nice to have you here. Thank you. And thank you to everyone who's joining us at home. We're excited to have you. A um, couple of reminders, as we're going through today's program, we want to encourage you to post your comments, post your questions in the comments field. We're going to try to keep an eye on that and answer them as we go along. We'll answer as many as we can throughout the program. And also, just a reminder that what we're sharing here today is great information, but it's not intended to be medical advice. We want to encourage you, if you ever have questions, if you have concerns, Please talk to your healthcare professional, your, um, your primary care physician, or other healthcare professional about your specific concerns because everybody is unique. Every situation is different, which we'll touch on also here today. So, with that, um, Dr. Schrader, can you tell us a little bit about why breast cancer awareness is so important? So, breast cancer awareness is important because it is the number one cancer among women short of skin cancer and it is the number one cancer killer in women short of lung cancer. Before we get started, I just want to make sure that everybody understands. It's your body. Nobody's going to know it as well as you do. You need to be your own best advocate. So when we talk about breast awareness, it's or breast cancer awareness, it also includes breast awareness. And it includes each individual woman or man knowing and being aware of their breasts. But most importantly, breast awareness or breast cancer awareness is important because we know that if we find breast cancer early, not only do we have better survival, fewer deaths, but we also have more opportunities to spare the breasts. 50, 75 years ago, mastectomies were the only option. Now if we find them early, we do mostly, 80% of most of the surgeries we do can be breast conserving surgery. Women can save their breasts. So Breast Cancer Awareness, Breast Cancer Awareness Month is all about getting women to understand they need to be their own advocate, they need to be aware of their breasts, and understand that although one in eight women will get breast cancer, if it's found early, you can save a life and you can save a breast. It's all good stuff. So you mentioned one in eight women um, will develop breast cancer, that's the, the average. But um, you know, men can also develop breast cancer, so it's important that we don't just speak to the women out there, but also the men. So Patty, how common is it among men and women? Okay, well, there was a time when there were individuals who would say, I don't know anybody who's ever had breast cancer. Nobody in my family's ever had it. I've never had a friend who's had it. A lot of that was because there was a time when people did not discuss it. They more or less kept it in the closet they felt ashamed. Women would actually feel that it was dirty. We would have women who would say they got into the shower because they found a lump. Um, we are at a good time because even though we now know there are so many women who do develop breast cancer, the awareness is now helping other women be proactive and do something about it. The American Cancer Society uh, has uh, actually reported that 2017 we'll have about 250,000 new cases of breast cancer in women. Um, men will get breast cancer as well and their risk is about one in a thousand. As Dr. Uh, Schrader mentioned, we are still saying one in eight, which is about a 12% lifetime risk for women. Women have to realize when they hear that statistic that that doesn't mean that at 25 they have a one in eight chance and sometimes they get quite frightened, especially if they have it in their family. So it's relative to age. The greatest number of women who get breast cancer are women that are over the menopause. Roughly at least two thirds to three fourths of the uh, newly diagnosed cases are going to be women in that age group. 
we actually had a local gynecologist years ago who said that when she was going through her training, she had never heard of a young woman who ever got breast cancer. Now, of course, because we have early detection and awareness and, and that we are practicing regular screening, we are finding cases in those high-risk women younger. So as far as men, their risk is much lower than ours. Uh, relative risk about 1%, 1 in a 1,000. But the important thing about men is that they aren't necessarily geared like we are to be aware and to think about it. Uh, we've had men who have developed lumps in their breast who attributed it to the fact that they were working out at the gym and thought they developed their pecs. So we do have a more recent um, program where we are actually making more awareness to men be one of the goals in the program that I work with. And what we do is we actually allow diagnostic testing for men as well under my program. So when you think of women in general, I think we'd have a hard time finding somebody now who would say, I don't know anybody who's had breast cancer. It is so prominent that somebody has a friend, a coworker, um, somebody in their church, and possibly somebody in their family. So it it is the fact that we are finding it earlier and also possibly that we have more factors in our lifestyles that are contributing as well as the fact that women are living longer so that they are getting to the age where they're more at risk. Thank you, Patty. So you mentioned some of the different factors that can contribute to um, uh, breast cancer. So Dara, what are some of the risk factors that women should be aware of and men should be aware of that might lead to developing breast cancer? Right, so for women, uh, one of the risk factors for developing breast cancer is exposure over time to estrogen. Mm -hmm. And so women may be at increased risk if they start their periods very early in, in life or go through menopause later in life. They have a greater time that they're exposed to estrogen. Um, women who take hormonal replacement therapy after menopause have a higher risk of um, breast cancer, again, because they're being exposed to estrogen. Um, uh, women with uh, family history, um, and, and we'll talk about that when we talk about genetics, um, have a greater his, fam, uh, risk for breast cancer development. Um, and then women who haven't had children or delay their first um, child till after age 30 also have a higher risk. Um, environmental factors probably play into it. Um, alcohol uh, use um, greater than one unit a day. <laughs> we talked about that earlier. One unit um, can increase the risk of um, uh, breast cancer as well as um, a postmenopausal weight gain. Uh, so that again raises that estrogen level in the blood. Um, yeah. So there's some things that we can control and some that are just how we're made. Exactly. And so it's good to keep that in mind as we're yeah. talking about risk. Best to avoid um, postmenopausal weight gain is, mm -hmm. is, is important and best to avoid um, hormone replacement therapy if possible. Right. Yeah. So making some good lifestyle choices can help lower our risk to some degree. Mm -hmm. Good weight, you said, and not drinking excessively and exercise exercising. Exercising. We talk about all the time with so many different things that applies to breast cancer as well. So Dr. Schrader, what are some of the early signs of breast cancer? When should an individual reach out to their healthcare provider with any concerns that they may have? Again, in, in keeping with my general favorite line, which is you need to be your own best advocate, anything that concerns you is worth bringing up with your healthcare provider. If you're looking for specific signs or symptoms of breast cancer, keep in mind that a lot of them overlap with benign issues. And in fact, most of the time when women do sense a change or have a problem, it probably is benign, but nobody's in a position to judge that better than a physician. And so if you have any concerns, make sure you bring it up with your healthcare provider. So things to look at, and it means, again, breast self-exams are no longer really uh, advocated, so you know, the specific technical aspect of a breast self-breast exam. Studies have suggested it may not have been that helpful, so we've changed this to breast awareness. It means looking at your breasts, looking at, in the, looking at them in the mirror, whether you're a man or a woman, after a shower, 
Are you seeing a dimple? Do you see a change in your breast? Is your nipple changing direction or is it being pulled back into the breast or what we call retracting? Um, do you see some redness, either a patch of redness or the whole breast is red on the areola or the dark colored part of the skin around the nipple? Are you seeing any scaling or like a rash? Are you, do you feel a lump? Do you have pain in a specific place? These are all the things that you want to take note of. Sometimes they can be cyclical, so if you are patient enough, you can wait one cycle if you're a woman and see if some of those symptoms resolve. But at any time you have a concern about a change in your breast, best just to see a healthcare provider. Don't be put off. If you have a concern, you want to make sure those questions are answered to your satisfaction. And sometimes it takes being persistent, but ultimately you need to take care of yourself. One thing I thought you had mentioned when we talked earlier that was really good advice too is if you do see a change, I think it'd be really easy to get nervous, get anxious, you call your doctor, you want instant response. And um, I felt reassured when you had mentioned in our conversation that you know, this is not something that's going to happen overnight. It's not all of a sudden you wake up and bam, you have you know stage four breast cancer. Mm -hmm but it's something that you do want to be proactive about and make that connection but if they say you know we have an appointment in a week or in two weeks it's not cause for panic absolutely you know it's always scariest when it's you and again remember most of these symptoms can be attributed to other things that are benign but the natural biology even a very aggressive breast cancers tends not to require an emergent visit and so rather than panic going to an ER may not be the best choice these are not people who are necessarily trained to do good breast exams they are dealing with more emergent things but if it takes a week or two to get in to see your primary care that is absolutely fine it is not going to change your outcome don't let it go though if they say they can't see you or they cancel or you cancel or something comes up don't put it off and go oh well that's okay you know Make sure you're seen and make sure your questions are answered to your satisfaction. Great advice. So the common screening tool that we've all heard about is mammograms and it's something that every woman should be doing. So Patty, can you tell us a little bit more about that? When should women start? How often should we have mammograms? Do men get mammograms? Good questions. <laughs> okay. So um, mammograms in general have been uh, and the importance and the frequency have become pretty controversial. And at first, those of us who worked in the field were pretty dismayed by it, but you know, I always believe in uh, that silver lining. And actually, what's resulted is that it's brought more awareness actually to the importance of mammography because we now have women who are asking questions about it and the other thing that is very very good is that it's bringing women in to see physicians for their clinical breast exams because a lot of the recommendations have to do with talking with your physician about your personal risk factors and how frequently you should have it done uh, based on your personal history and family history and lifestyle. Um, in general, um, the American College of Radiology, uh, the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology are pretty still holding uh, uh, fast on annual mammogram is good. Um, the American Cancer Society has started now saying they women can start at age 45 and have them annually between 45 and 54 and after that every two years. The U.S. Task Force um, is a little bit more conservative. They're saying that women can start uh, in their 50s and do it every two years. A lot of the those of us who work in the field really feel strongly that the annual mammogram is being proactive and especially for high-risk indi individuals uh, the most um, at this point uh, the most accurate way to get early detection for women uh, overall those who can afford MRIs and more sophisticated type testing the mammogram is still our gold standard so with the program I work with which is the Every Woman Counts program we are very permissive we allow women, we recommend annual mammograms, we allow women to have mammograms 
uh, annually in their 40s and after uh, 50 as well. We strongly recommend that they see their primary care provider, that they obtain a clinical breast exam, that they discuss with their health care provider um, what their personal risk factors, et cetera, are, and that they work together on a plan uh, to, to actually adjust their um, mammogram screening with their personal history. As far as um, men, at this time, we're not recommending screening for men. Uh, there are men who are more at risk, and these are people who uh, may have that family history, and, and Dara will be discussing that uh, later, but we do provide diagnostics for men who have symptoms. So in the program I work with, Every Woman Counts, we recently have had uh, a new bill that was signed by the governor uh, allowing us to screen men as not screen but provide diagnostic testing for men with breast symptoms as well of any age as well as women uh, of any age. So uh, that's an advancement. It allows more of our target populations to be able to also benefit from early detection. Uh, the Every Woman Counts program um, has been around since 1994 and in California we have always started screening at the age of 40 and uh, now we also can provide diagnostics for individuals under 40. So I, I think um, if you look at it overall there are some positive aspects to the fact that there are different guidelines that have come up and there's been more discussion and more of the ability for the healthcare professional and the patient to share responsibility and discuss it and make it a, a lot more personal instead of the day where some physicians would just hand a prescription and say, go have a mammogram. Now we're having women, because of the confusion, asking their doctors, wanting to sit down and discuss it and have a breast exam and have it streamlined to their own personal health. That's great to hear that. So I, if we can talk a little bit more about the Every Woman Counts program. So, you know, we're making all these encouragements to talk to your physician and to be proactive, but there's still a lot of women out there who maybe don't have a primary care doctor, who maybe don't have insurance. And it's important to know there are resources out there for all women to be able to access these important screening tools, and Every Woman Counts really helps with that. Exactly. We are very fortunate uh, in Butte County and in Glen County and our surrounding areas in the fact that we have wonderful resources and we have providers who are very proactive and interested in serving our women. And with the Every Woman Counts program, it is a program that's based on age for screening, socioeconomic um, income, um, and um, also being a resident of California. So for our program, we have identified what we call our target uh, groups that have historically been underscreened, and they are Native American, African American, Pacific, uh, Asian Pacific Islander, um, the LGBT, uh, and as well rural of all ethnicities. The region I serve is a 16 county area from the Oregon border down to Napa and Sonoma. So within that population, we now are be, being able to provide both screening starting at the age 40, and again, that's available every year. It's recommended, and um, a lot of women do take advantage of having their annual mammograms. For women and men who develop symptoms of any age, we now also provide the diagnostic mammogram, ultrasound, and biopsy if it's indicated. We also have a program that will allow these individuals to access treatment should they be diagnosed with a pre-cancer or a cancer, and that is a program called the Breast and Cervical Cancer Treatment Program. Again, the income is based on 200% of the federal poverty level, 
Um, this program is so wonderful because even though we have the Affordable Care Act and we have more availability for individuals to access insurance through the California um, insurance exchanges, many of them are provided their screening but then have large deductibles when it comes time to have to get a diagnostic if something is found. And so we partner with the ACA. We actually are able to provide that gap for individuals who have the Affordable Care Act, have gone in, had a routine screening, and then uh, have not met their deductible or cannot pay their co-pays and have now a need to have more diagnostic services. And those women and men can be enrolled in the Every Woman Counts program and they can obtain their diagnostic imaging uh, through to a, a diagnosis and then cancer treatment. Um, locally, we have also had a program that has served our, um, our individuals, both men and women, for several years and it's called Bridging the Gap. That has been a wonderful program that has helped fill in the areas where we did not have any coverage for men or for women under 40. And as we all know who work in the field, we are seeing young individuals get breast cancer. And the Bridging the Cap program is a program that's through the Kenyan Oaks Women's Golf League. They have a tournament every year and the proceeds go into a fund and those funds are accessible to individuals in Butte and Glen County through the Chico Breast Center right here. And so individuals who may not qualify for another avenue can come in through the Chico Breast Center and be enrolled in Bridging the Gap and obtain um, their screening. We have a lot of local resources that help individuals who have gone through cancer and are going through cancer. Uh, through ENLA, we have the Compassion Fund. Uh, we have um, donations through the California Health Collaborative where we help individuals who need special resources if they need to travel out of town and they need gas cards, etc. So I would say when I look at our area here in Butte and Glen County and the surrounding areas, and compare with some of the areas that I serve where we do not have these resources, we are truly, truly in a good place uh, between having the breast center available to our women and all the expertise. Um, I use this region of mine as an example every time I have to report back to the state as to what we're doing right being in a place where we have it together and we're doing right. And I'd love to duplicate this throughout my region because I, I just think that we um, are, are blessed. And that's the only way I can put it. Uh, an individual who gets diagnosed here uh, can feel very confident that she's in good hands or he's in good hands and there are caring people who are here to serve them and, and help them through their road to recovery. So I'm, I'm you know, just... Loving being here. <laughs> <laughs> we love having you. Here. And I, I love it that there is such a support network for yes. individuals who are going through this really difficult situation if they're faced with a breast cancer diagnosis. Um, another note for all of you at home, then uh, I want to re encourage you to post your questions or comments if you have things. We have a great panel here who's ready to answer them for you. Um, but also we will be sharing the contact information. So we're talking about a lot of programs, a lot of resources, and in the comments we'll be posting phone numbers, um, web addresses if you want to research to get more information on, about any of the things that are being brought up today. So um, don't worry, there will be information there that you can refer back to after the program. Um, so, um, we have talked about a lot of different things. So screening and diagnostic has come up multiple times in what you all have shared. So Dara, can you explain to the audience what's the difference between a screening versus a diagnostic mammogram? Right, so a screening mammogram is your annual mammogram. It begins usually, like Patty said, at age 40. Um, you go in, you may have a clinical breast exam first and then they refer you for your mammogram or sometimes in some cases you just 
get referred for your mammogram. There's no problems that you're looking at, no, no symptoms, no concerns that you have. A diagnostic mammogram is where you have a symptom, uh, much like Dr. Schrader brought up, could be uh, a change in your breast, a, a lump, a bump, a skin change, and you bring it to your healthcare provider's attention and they order a diagnostic mammogram so that the radiologist looking at the mammogram knows there's a concern, a problem that needs to be addressed. And so um, these are the two different ways you know, we, we, we order them. And it's really important that if you have a breast symptom that you see your healthcare provider first so that they can order the proper diagnostic mammogram. And a lot of times during a diagnostic mammogram too, they might also have the opportunity to do an ultrasound, which can't always be done at a screen, uh, is not done at a screening mammogram, I should say. Right, so just a more focused look at whatever the problem area is, mm -hmm. which is great. So um, another thing Patty was sharing is the different timing when women should start getting mammograms, how often, and there's a lot of difference of opinion in that. But besides that, then um, what about clinical breast exams? What, how does that fit into the screening process? When should women or men reach out and have a clinical exam done? So as I mentioned before, what a clinical breast exam represents, if we're looking at breast self-awareness, that's you, either the woman or the man, noticing a change, taking a look, feeling your breasts, if you're having pain and nipple discharge. A clinical breast exam is an examination that has a very specific pattern that's provided by your healthcare provider. Typically for women, it will begin when they start seeing a gynecologist. This typically begins, you know, in their late teens, early 20s. Current recommendations are for a clinical breast exam every one to three years. And the, the range is based really on a conversation with your provider, your age, current issues, do you have very dense breasts, do you have very lumpy breasts, um, do you have other risk factors, family history, so these are all things that are going to be taken into consideration when breast or a clinical breast exam is recommended. I think typically in younger women, beginning at about age 20, um, you start seeing a gynecologist. Most gynecologists are very adept at breast exams and know, know what they're looking for. Um, as we get older, Again, at the other end of advanced age, you know, if you're 80s, no risk factors, breasts are benign, you know, you may be able to sp spread that out a little bit. But it really needs to be a conversation. And again, anytime you see something, you know, just like with terrorism, if you see something, say something. <laughs> if you feel something, see something, make sure your provider knows. Um, mammograms can still miss small breast cancers. There are certain kinds of breast cancers that don't show up very well on mammograms. Um, the combination of a diagnostic study, a mammogram plus a sonogram, is probably going to pick up close to 90% or, or more of early breast cancers. But there are still some that women can pick up themselves when they start seeing nipple inversion or they start seeing a change in the skin of their areola. That's a much earlier way to find things and sometimes can find things that mammograms may miss. And I, I've had a couple of my friends who just happen to feel a lump in doing them or have been to the doctors and it triggered further conversation. Mm -hmm. So you know, it's hit very close to home for me personally how important those are. Mm -hmm. um, so do your exams and talk to your doctor, don't wait. <laughs> <laughs> one, one of the things is that even though we're not actually recommending a systematic pattern of look of you know examining we do want women to have a, a plan of care and so besides being aware I always recommend that woman if she finds a lump at midnight on a Friday night pick up the phone and tell someone that loves her that will keep her legitimate that will make her do something because if you do that then they won't let you go and that's what happened with me when I had one I had a friend and even though everything was negative she said I don't like it and the text said, I don't like it. And it was like, okay, you got to do something about it. And I just, I, I cannot underestimate the importance of a woman feeling like she can trust herself, by, but giving it to someone else so that they will also encourage her 
to follow through with it. That's a great idea. Well, it, it's the village, right? We're mm -hmm. looking out for each mm -hmm. other. We're encouraging each other to be our own advocates. Um, and it's, it's important. You can't put a price on that. That's huge. Yeah. And I think that goes back when we very first started about how prevalent it is. You know, raising the awareness, maybe there's always been one in eight or one in seven women getting breast cancer, but because we're talking about it so much more, we see it more. So I think that's great advice. That's a great advice. Yeah. So switching gears just a little bit, um, Dara, we've heard a lot more, it seems like in the last few years, about genetic testing. It's become much more popular. And with the family history risk factors, how does that play in? And can you tell us a little bit about genetic testing? Yeah, so we provide genetic testing here at uh, Enlo Comprehensive Breast Care. We call it cancer, uh, genetic cancer risk assessment. And in our clinic, when we see people who are newly diagnosed with breast cancer, we always take a family history, and if their family history is suggestive of a hereditary uh, cancer syndrome, so if there are multiple individuals associated, uh, excuse me, uh, diagnosed with breast cancer or ovarian cancer, they usually see me prior to their surgery so that they can have a discussion about whether or not this is a hereditary um, cancer syndrome. And so what we do is we have a, a session and we test for um, uh, hereditary cancer syndromes through genetic testing. And this is testing your DNA <laughs> um, <laughs> for these changes in genes that um, actually are uh, protective. So we're looking for mutations in in genes that protect us from cancer. And the most common are genes called BRCA1 and BRCA2, which many people have heard of um, calling it BRCA genes. And right. this was in the news a lot in the last few years. Um, so going back to our patients, so we see them um, preoperatively because we know that women who have genetic mutations in BRCA1 and BRCA2 um, have a higher risk of developing a second breast cancer as well as a higher risk of developing a uh, breast cancer in their other breast. And so we want to try to address it preoperatively because although most of the time we do lumpectomy now, these women may choose to have a mastectomy uh, rather than a lumpectomy due to their ri increased risk over time. And that may be for one or both breasts, even if mm -hmm. the cancer at that time is just in one side. Yes, and so, yeah, and so these women may choose to have um, a, a a preventative or prophylactic right. mastectomy on the other side. Yes. And then we do get a lot of referrals from the community too. And so a lot of these referrals are women who n don't necessarily have cancer but are, have a significant family history. And so we get referrals from the uh, community health providers. And so we assess their risk and we provide genetic testing. When at all possible, we encourage uh, the, the um, individual in the family who has the highest likelihood of having a mutation. So in other words, for an example, so I see a 25 year old young woman who's got a family history of breast cancer. Maybe her mother had breast cancer at 40. And so her gynecologist or her healthcare provider refers her to me for discussion. Well, I'm going to tell that woman that yes, she might be at increased risk based on family history, but in fact, we should test her mother if her mother is alive for uh, genetic mutations because that's a more informative result. Mm -hmm. um, if we test a young woman or any woman who is negative and has a significant family history of breast cancer, we can't take away that. She still has an increased risk mm -hmm. because we haven't identified a genetic change yet in the family that, that we are aware of. So always if we can find a person who has the highest likelihood of, of, of harboring that mutation, we, we um, want to test them. So like I said, we see women who are newly diagnosed with cancer, we see women who have a history of breast cancer, as well as individuals with a family history of breast cancer. And so the BRCA genes, um, like I mentioned, have a real high risk of breast and ovarian cancer, although there can be other cancers in, in these families as well, including uh, metastatic or uh, prostate cancer, uh, pancreatic cancer, um, I mentioned ovarian cancer, um, and even sometimes melanomas. And so when we're looking at a family history, we're not just looking at um, breast and ovarian, we're also looking for those other types of cancers. That might be a clue um, that there's a hereditary uh, cancer uh, syndrome. Right, so you mentioned prostate, so that could, if, if a woman is tested, has had breast cancer, shows that she does have that mutation, then it might 
indicate that her son should be more aware they may have an increased right. risk. Right, so there is an increased risk of male breast cancer, and I think uh, mm -hmm. uh, Patty mentioned the average man has a, a one in 1,000 risk, right. uh, one in 1,000 risk of developing breast cancer. So with a BRCA2 mutation, um, the risk can be as high as about 6 to 7% uh, cumulative lifetime risk. With a BRCA1 mutation, about 1.2%. So for men who have these mutations, although we don't recommend annual screening mammograms, we recommend that we start uh, teaching them self-breast exam and they have a clinical breast exam yearly. And of course, for any findings, uh, they have a mammogram uh, to, to uh, look at that. Um, in fact, if you know a man who has breast cancer, <laughs> he should have genetic testing. So any man who's had breast cancer um, or a family member. Come see um, you. <laughs> yes. Um, and then, um, so I didn't talk about screening for, for women who don't have cancer who have these mutations. So when you have a mutation in a gene such as BRCA1, BRCA2, you have this high cumulative risk of breast cancer throughout your lifetime. And so what we do is we begin by screening these women um, at age 25 with uh, annual uh, MRI of the breast. And this is because the breast tissue is very dense. And so mammogram is not going to be particularly helpful uh, in, in younger women. Plus, it's more radiation exposure over time. And so we want to try to avoid that, yeah. especially if it's not going to be helpful. <laughs> um, and so then beginning at age 30, we combine annual mammogram and annual MRI. And so like in January, you have your MRI. In June, you have your mammogram. And then we recommend that these women are seen twice a year for clinical breast exam, and then again, that self-breast awareness, knowing that knowing what your breasts uh, feel like, uh, reporting any changes um, uh, to your healthcare provider. So these would be younger women that if their mom was tested and shown to have the BRCA mutation, then you would start screening the younger woman, not necessarily that she's had that same genetic testing. Is Actually, that we would right? in the, in the case where there's a known genetic mutation in the family, we mm -hmm. always recommend that um, these women uh, have genetic testing have themselves. themselves. And okay. and if they so if mom has a BRCA mutation, uh, the daughter and the sons both have a 50, 50 chance of inheriting that same mutation. And so if they don't have the mutation, they still might be at increased risk, um, but uh, not to the degree of, um, you know, carrying the mutation. Yeah. Um, some women may choose to have a preventative mastectomy or prophylactic mastectomy even um, without cancer with a BRCA mutation because mm -hmm. that risk over time is so high. Mm -hmm. And that's a very personal decision that women have, you know, it depends a lot on their age, um, you know, when they find out they have this mutation. If a woman is 65 and finds out she has a BRCA mutation, it may not be the same as if a woman is 30 and she's got a longer life ahead of her and, and increased risk. Um, and she may tire of MRI and mammogram every <laughs> six months. <laughs> so I'm done. I'm done. So, um, and the other important thing is the ovarian cancer risk. Although we're not talking about ovarian cancer this month, the ovarian cancer risk is um, very high with these mutations, um, anywhere from 8% to 60 something percent risk of ovarian cancer and we do not have a good uh, screening tool for ovarian cancer so women who have a BRCA mutation it's recommended that they have risk reduction surgery which includes removing the tubes and ovaries um, usually by age 35 to 45 depending on which mutation mm -hmm. um, so um, and if you see like male breast cancer ovarian cancer is rare not as rare as male breast cancer but when you see ovarian cancer in a family again trigger to think genetics and if you see breast and ovarian cancer in a family, think genetics. <laughs> so well, it's um, important yeah. because it, it's closer than just the general population. Exactly. Yeah. So um, you've mentioned mom several mm -hmm. times, but we also talk globally about family history. So what if you know a woman has, like in my case, my grandmother had breast cancer, mm -hmm. or if it's aunties or sisters, or how how does that affect mm -hmm. what our risk is? Right, so we use empiric uh, risk models. There's several um, that we use, and we kind of just do them all together when a patient comes in. And so um, these take into account all the things that we've talked about, um, estrogen exposure over time, um, family history, has the woman had any breast biopsies, what were the findings of those breast biopsies, um, how many family members in her family um, have had cancer, breast or ovarian cancer, and we plug all these numbers into a, um, a risk model, and then we come out with a, with a number. If the, if the if the risk is greater than 20% lifetime risk uh, of breast cancer, then we begin 
we give that woman the option of, of screening just as we would a BRCA mutation, mammogram, MRI uh, exams every six months. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, and again, we assess that risk every year because as you age and you don't develop breast cancer, you're gonna come back down to uh, average risk. So uh, it's important to, that we don't just keep with the high risk every, every year without assessing the risk because right. at some point you get credit for time served, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and, yeah, and you, um, you may come down, down to more population risk. And right. so, um, so yeah, here at the clinic, I see these women usually once a year and I assess their risk every year by updating all that data into the, into the risk models. So um, can anybody just come to the clinic and say, I'm worried, I want to be tested, I want to do the genetic testing, or do you need a referral from a primary care? Yes. Does insurance factor into that? Or? Um, so we ask for a referral from your primary care provider or your gynecologist, whoever you see. Um, we have a brochure, I'm going to show it to you. <laughs> and um, we're going to be giving these to healthcare providers in the community, and then this is also going to be posted on, our, on the website, website. Yeah, yeah, and definitely. this will kind of go through our uh, assessment process and and what you need to do and talks about cost and that kind of thing. Yeah. Nice. So lots of great information. So we're getting close to wrapping up today's session. Um, is there anything else that you would want to share with our audience? Things that you want to make sure we we remember. We don't forget the takeaways that are so important. I think one thing I'd like to just bring up, um, apropos of mammograms and that kind of thing, a lot, there's a lot of um, talk about breast density. It is being shown to be an independent risk factor for the development of breast cancer. Um, it's not exactly clear how much of an additional risk. There are schools of thought that suggest it can increase risk by 20 to 30 percent, which would actually be a higher risk than a lot of the other lesser risk factors like alcohol consumption, estrogen use. Um, but that's not widely held. There's still a lot of controversy. But the issue with dense breasts is it makes it more difficult for mammograms to see through the tissue. Uh, we do have better technology now. We have 3D, what we call 3D tomograms or 3D mammograms. They can actually do a better job of looking through the breast tissue. But even beyond that, there is some intrinsic risk. So you should just be aware. Um, I wouldn't jump off the deep end because you have dense breasts, but I think it makes the idea of clinical breast exams and regular mammography and possibly the addition of a sonogram more important. You always wanna make sure that you're getting your imaging studies at a reputable, high quality uh, facility that has the latest technology and has radiologists that are specifically trained. Mammograms and sonograms are very, um, difficult interpretations at times and I think it's important that you just are very comfortable that you have a high quality facility that you're being tested at. That and I would add if you, if, that they have the ability to do a biopsy. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Uh, yeah. In case something is seen right. on yeah. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. And don't be afraid to go get a mammogram. Exactly. I know when I started getting close to that time and all my friends were like, oh, I have to do it or it's gonna hurt or it's gonna this or that. It doesn't. It's important and it's not scary. I swear. <laughs> <laughs> well, like the American Cancer Society suggests, give yourself a birthday present. Yeah. We all live very busy lives. And how many times have we all heard our friend, you know, oh, Patty, when was the last time you had your mammogram? Oh. <laughs> you know, and time flies. So take an event annually and tag it to your mammogram, whether it's your birthday, whether it's the first of the year whether it's Easter, whatever. Make sure you have it on your calendar. It's a 15 to 20 minute event. It might be a little bit uncomfortable, but I can tell you the treatment of breast cancer is probably a little bit more uncomfortable than that. Yes. Yeah. Agreed. Absolutely. All right. Well, thank you very much um, to our panel. So Dara, Dr. Schrader, and Patty, thank you for taking the time and sharing so much great information. It's been a pleasure. <laughs> Excellent. I always enjoy these. I learned so much. <laughs> And thank you to everyone who joined us at home, and we hope that you'll tune in next week. We'll have the second of our series for Breast Cancer Awareness Month. We're going to be joined by Rebecca Senalu from the Cancer Center Library, as well as um, three breast cancer survivors who are in various stages of treatment and survivorship, and they'll be sharing their personal experiences with all of you. So thank you again. Have a great day, and we'll see you next week.